We will now move on to our 6.4 or 9.30 uh, presentation of Lake County Behavioral Health Services Fiscal Year 2021 and 2022 External Quality Review Final Report. And uh, we'll invite uh, Director Metcalf up. And uh, I don't know if you wanted to, did you want to come up too as, as well? Or? Okay. Ms. Jones. This is new, this, this gate thing. Thank you, Matthew, wherever you are. Well, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, my name is Todd Metcalf. I'm the director of the Bayville Health Services Department. What we're doing today, this is something new. We've never done this before um, in front of the board. <laughs> You've heard me mention um, over the years that our department um, I shouldn't say endures, but we, uh, we're audited a lot by various um, entities. This, um, today, this presentation, we'll try to keep it short, um, is a result of what's called the EQRO audit, which we had in December. EQRO stands for External Quality Review Organization. What this means is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid um, require mental health plans to be audited on an annual basis. The California Department of Healthcare Services oversees the mental health plan, but the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid require the Department of Healthcare Services to ensure that we are audited by an external organization. Um, we do this every year. The, uh, the name of the organization that has been auditing us, at least ever since I've uh, been in this position, is called Behavioral Health Concepts Incorporated. So, Matthew, can you move to the next slide, please? Um, thank you. So, this sort of explains uh, what all is involved um, in these reviews. And so, as I said earlier, um, I, we want to bring more of these audits to this board. Um, it's all about our, um, you know, our, our goal in being transparent um, and ensuring that the community and the board understands what we're doing. Um, this. <laughs> This is going to show the good, the bad, and the ugly, but um, we want to be transparent. And so um, Elise uh, Jones, our administrative uh, deputy director, um, pretty much put this together. And so I'm going to let you drive this presentation. I will chime in as needed, and I promise not to be a backseat driver. Um, but I will let you take it from here. And with your um, permission, I will pop in as needed. My pleasure. Ooh, that's live. Okay. Um, it's at Ma Matthew's behind the scenes there, so we can go to the next slide. Thank you for that introduction. Oh. All right. So there is a methodology to these reviews. The reviews are conducted by interdisciplinary teams who have a variety of professional and lived experience. And pre-COVID times, this group would actually come in. We would host them at our department. Um, they would sit. Um, we would give them any and all documentation that they requested. And now in COVID times, they have been conducted via Zoom, which is, which is cool. And um, we will see how that continues. So the teams re review and utilize qualitative and quantitative data to provide uh, feedback to our department about how we're doing on a variety of metrics. And they also conduct interviews with key county staff, contracted providers, advisory groups, beneficiaries of services, family members, and other important stakeholders. And this data, both the quantitative and qualitative, is used to generate uh, performance measures uh, in the form of tables and graphs, which will cover a few of those that I felt um, told an important story. Um, and so they also derive data from monthly Medi-Cal eligibility system uh, files from the Department of Healthcare Services, short doyle Medi-Cal claims, and inpatient consolidation files. So it's not just data from us, it's also data that we have submitted from the Department of Healthcare Services. Thank you, Matthew. All right, so there are um, some significant changes and initiatives that we're really pleased to report. 
Um, we have expanded our access team. Our access team is the first point of contact for people who are trying to access services at behavioral health. And that has been an evolution. Um, we have reconstructed our access process to expedite uh, entry into services and assessment. And that has dramatically improved our timeliness with regard to initial intake and assessment. Um, we also plan to join or opt into the organized delivery system, and your board can anticipate a presentation from our department on April 26 for more information. Um, in fiscal year 21-22, we dramatically increased our community outreach and engagement through use of media outlets, press releases, health fairs, and we also, through um, the wonderful cannabis grant funds, were able to purchase a cargo van, and we hope to actually soon... Uh, bring it out to the world, but it's really beautiful. And that van is uh, really targeting at-risk communities and bringing needed supplies and outreach to them. All right, so we have also joined, uh, this is huge. Uh, so we're part of uh, Cal MHSA, um, and this is the Cal Mental Health Services Act. And so through, through Cal MHSA, we are joining a multi-county electronic health record. Um, your board had already approved us participating in a robust request for proposals process conducted by CalMesa. And that, pro that process led to the selection of a, uh, a new EHR vendor. And we actually anticipate joining um, and going live with that new vendor on January 1, 2023. And it's our hope that this will be the next wave or evolution for us in collecting data. Um, data has been uh, <laughs> something that's been very important to us, and this is going to be an incredible tool, so very excited about that. We've also joined a multi-county innovation project to really evaluate our full-service partnership program. FSP is our most um, uh, expensive program in uh, MHSA. It's, it's part of direct client services and supports, and this is, again, looking at our data as it compares to other counties implementing FSP and identifying where we can improve our FSP program and using both qualitative and quantitative data uh, to identify appropriate performance metrics for that program, and we hope to present on that um, soon. Very soon. And, and may I add, um, regarding the electronic health record system, um, we were one of how many pilot counties um, uh, in, in helping with the development of and the selection of um, the vendor that will be operating this electronic health record system. And as Elise mentioned, and as I have mentioned, and you all have mentioned about data, our, our existing electronic health record system, um, although data gets entered into it, um, it's not the most streamlined um, easy to use system in, in order to, to spit data out. And so we've been very hopeful and, and we've been very involved in the development of this new system. Um, a lot of it around the collection and reporting of data. Uh, yes, actually, that implementation is phased, so not all counties are going to go live on January 1, but we were so excited and anxious to go live as soon as possible that we joined the pilot counties. We felt like um, to be frank, our given system, we had really nothing to lose. So we're <laughs> jumping in with both feet. Okay. Uh, the mental health plan, which is us, we operate a centralized access team. And as I stated, that's uh, directly responsible for assessing and linking beneficiaries to specialty mental health services. And um, we served in uh, fiscal year 2021, 20, 610 adult beneficiaries, 299 youth, 51 older adults, and we obviously have two clinics, so this is across both of our clinics. And among those served, 25 received telehealth services in a language other than English, which I think demonstrates um, our intense efforts at cultural competency, efficiency, and outreaching to underserved communities. And we're very excited about the older adult piece, because that's, that's an area that our department hasn't been lacking, but um, our mental health advisory board has really been focusing on service delivery to older adults experiencing mental illness. Can use the microphone. So, so we recently <laughs> just um, created an older adult team. We're still uh, putting that together. So um, we're, we're really starting to focus more um, on the older adult uh, demographic. Okay, so there are key access components 
that the mental health plan is evaluated against. And this is a really delightful slide because we met all of them. Um, so the first one is service accessibility and availability are reflective of cultural competence, principles and practices. We were evaluated to meet that metric. Uh, manages and adapts capacity to meet beneficiaries. Again, met integration and or collaboration to improve access and service access and availability. So on our access through our expanded access team and efforts to streamline access processes, um, I, in hindsight, I wish I had provided a comparison of last year, um, but you can hopefully take my word for it that it is dramatically improved from last year. All right, next slide. Which, which is compelling because of the pandemic and still having to do a lot of work via telehealth. Um, and we, pr we provided in service, um, in person services uh, where and when we could, and of course we still are. Um, our uh, programs and services did not stop during the pandemic, but I think it's noteworthy to, to, to again say that's kind of a big deal that we did meet those requirements despite, you know, COVID 19. Thank you, Todd. And to any of our staff watching, that's a direct reflection of their dedication and passion for this work. So, um, um, so the other performance measure here that I want to highlight is um, the percentage of eligible beneficiaries served by race, race and ethnicity. So the light purple line demonstrates the number of beneficiaries, and they get that from Medi-Cal data. So who are the people enrolled in Medi-Cal in our county? That's the potential of people who are eligible for our services, right? And so of that, it shows the number of people in that demographic that we served. And so that gap shows you exactly what it is, as a potential gap or a disparity. And so for Native American, people identifying as Native American, um, not much of a gap, if at all, um, we're doing pretty well. Um, the biggest gap, obviously, here is people who are of Hispanic Latino descent. We know that our penetration rate for outreaching and serving that population is low. Um, and it's low even compared to the rest of the state and other similarly sized uh, counties. And so. We have some theories about that. Um, one of them is we know we have a very robust peer support center in Clear Lake, Lavos, that's dedicated to serving people of um, Hispanic Latino origin. And they do a lot of work. Um, they, they do an incredible amount of outreach. So we're hypothesizing maybe people are just um, accessing services through those non-traditional routes because that's more comfortable for them. And there still is a lot of stigma in that community around accessing specialty mental health services. So it's something that we're trying to unpack more. We definitely have our eye on it um, and we hope that next year um, we see some improvement or some trending up where we're having a better penetration rate into that population. Next slide please. Okay. So these are the overall penetration rates for everybody who's eligible across years. And so um, the dark purple is us, that's Lake County Behavioral Health Services. The light purple is other small counties, and then the blue is just across the state. And so you can see that um, we've actually been trending very positive with regard to this. So in 2018, uh, there is about a 2%, um, we're about 2% less than other small counties and the state in terms of our penetration rates of eligible potential eligible beneficiaries. And that goes up over time where we're probably about, I don't know, a, a, well, the percents are up there. So what is that, like a 1% uh, gap? And so our hope is that when we come back again next year, we'll have closed that gap. So that's a positive trend. All right, thank you. So additional performance measures. So as you can see, timely access is a really critical and key performance metric for mental health plans. It's really important that people receive the services that they need when they need them. Um, and while we have dramatically improved our initial access, um, we definitely have capacity issues. And this is certainly no shock to your board. Um, we do maintain uh, large caseloads um, and increase in crisis calls, definitely. Uh, it waxes and wanes. Um, we have longer wait times. So once people come into services and they're assessed and deemed eligible for specialty mental health, we unfortunately have um, long wait times for services at times, especially, um, and this is quite unfortunate for children's services, where we maintain a pretty lengthy triage, triage list. So the triage list is exactly what it sounds like. We have kids that come into services, and we basically prioritize them in terms of acuity. So kids that are very high acuity and high need, uh, where they've been in and out of crisis, or maybe they're involved with systems like probation or child welfare, they're at the top of the triage list, and they're having outreach and engagement through a case manager, but 
but it's not, uh, you know, therapy, which we have a, quite a long triage list for. Um, so that's just an unfortunate reality. Uh, we have high turnover for our children's team, um, and it's just ongoing staffing challenges that impact our ability to provide services. Um, unfortunately, longer wait times for services uh, is looking like it results in decompensation where people get sick. They wait for services and they get sicker and then they go into crisis because they're not receiving services that they might need. So we do, uh, we do have a quality management and quality improvement program um, that meets regularly and reports directly to uh, leadership and, of course, our director. Um, part of that, we monitor compliance. Compliance is a small part of the overall quality improvement quality assurance team. I do want to highlight that the mental health plan utilizes the following outcome or assessment tools. Um, so I won't read them off here, but you can see there are eight, I can't count, uh, eight different tools that we use. And these are used at intake and ideally over time. So the goal here and what we really hope to realize with our new EHR is that it's going to be embedded into our EHR and really easy for clinicians to go through these at intake and then at regular intervals so we can track over time who's getting better or who's getting worse and we can kind of make more targeted interventions. Um, so that's something really exciting that I believe is right on the horizon for us. Okay, here's a really fun table of uh, other different um, quality, key quality components, and it's not as nice of a story as the access uh, table, unfortunately, but here you are. So um, quality assessment and performance improvement are organizational priorities, so I think that's self-explanatory, and EQRO rated us as partially met for that performance metric. Um, data is used to inform management and guide decisions, not met, so we have a lot of room for improvement on that. And hopefully, as I stated, our new EHR is going to elevate us into um, the future and be able to track those important performance and outcome metrics uh, timely. Communication from mental health plan administration and stakeholder input and involvement and system planning and implementation partially met. Evidence of a systematic clinical continuum of care not met. And so what they mean by that is we have very clear benchmarks for when people need to go into different levels of services. Um, and we can titrate up or titrate down people into uh, high need and low need. So we're not doing a very good job at that right now. We need to get better. And that's also part of the FSP innovation program is that there are not clear um, eligibility criteria for that. It's unclear when people are ready to transition to or step down to a low, lower level of care. And so I'm hoping that through that FSP innovation project, we're also going to use that data to inform our other systems level of care planning. Medication monitoring, partially met. Uh, psychotropic medication mon monitoring for youth, um, that is not met. And there'll be more information about that here shortly. Uh, measures clinical and our functional outcomes of beneficiaries served, so not met, but as I stated with all those outcome tools being streamlined into a new, more accessible EHR, hopefully, hopefully we're going to get better at that. Um, utilize information from beneficiary satisfaction surveys, and so that was not met. So regularly, actually annually, we are required to uh, collect con consumer perception data, so that's just how beneficiaries of services feel about our services. And so we could do a better job of integrating that into our decision-making processes. Um, Consumer-run and or consumer-driven programs exist to enhance wellness and recovery. That was met. And consumer and family member employment in key roles throughout the system was met. All right, next slide. Thank you. So beneficiary perceptions of care. So as I stated, EQRO conducts consumer perception surveys, as well as consumer family member focus groups. Um, and this yields qualitative and quantitative data. And the focus groups emphasize the ability of the timely access to care, recovery, peer support, cultural competence, and improved outcomes. So they're really assessing beneficiaries about how they feel on those metrics. Next slide. So we're happy to report that generally uh, beneficiaries feel really comfortable with uh, staff. They feel that staff are honest and reliable. 
Um, a highlight, and it continues to be a highlight, uh, is our peer support centers. So we just get raving reviews from our beneficiaries about the importance of those peer support centers. Um, again, that non-traditional level of support has been uh, really beneficial to the beneficiaries. And um, during the pandemic, uh, case managers, peer support spe specialists have been a major source of comfort and support for our community. Um, and it's been critical. You know, it's been a lifeline, think about during quarantine, um, how isolating that was. Yet we had this very dedicated team of case managers and peer support specialists who um, just stayed connected with people. Um, and they also, of course, link people to other resources in the community. Um, so next slide. Uh, the wait times in the perception of the beneficiaries varies, depends on the type of appointment. Uh, our follow-up after misappointments is, is mixed, and actually that's something that we're addressing as perhaps part of a new per, uh, performance improvement project. And group, uh, beneficiaries are not really aware of different committees that they could be a part of or ways to give feedback more directly to our, our department or be involved. And so we need to do a better job at incorporating or including the community into those venues. Um, one beneficiary did report that they completed the initial intake and did not have an assignment of, of um, a case manager um, and not receiving timely phone calls back from staff. And I would hypothesize that's because we are struggling to ma recruit and maintain staff, still recruit and retain, and um, it's difficult. Those caseloads do get high sometimes. Next slide. So I'm sure you're aware there are myriad opportunities for improvement within our department. Um, the most salient among those is the lack of clinical staffing and human resources um, contribute to lengthy wait times. And as I highlighted for children, that's a, that's a large triage list. Um, waiting for, you know, uh, primarily individual or group therapy. So they are getting some outreach and services, but it is definitely less than what they need. And so we are seeing that contribute to children um, sometimes escalating in and out of crisis, unfortunately. Um, we're struggling with staff and resources to initiate and complete and stay up to date with our quality improvement and quality assurance activities. Um, the EQRO also identified local budgetary constraints, uh, some communication issues, staffing shortages, and lack of resources contributing to high caseloads, staff burnout, and staff turnover rates. We are not tracking and trending HADIS measures as required by Senate Bill 1291. Um, that, is, that is a high priority for me, and there are multiple barriers to doing that. Um, data collection and tracking, as you are all aware, has been um, very challenging, and so my hope is that this time next year when we report on our EQRO, we will have resolved that issue. Next slide. So here are what I felt the highlights from EQRO in terms of their recommendations. So evaluate obstacles and implement strategies to decrease the children's triage team quite obviously. Um, we need to figure out and make more robust our um, existing QI staff resources and kind of get creative about the strategies to implement and, and, um, and make quality improvement projects a priority for our department. Not that they aren't, but we just, sometimes people are wearing, you know, two, three, four, five, six hats, and it can be challenging. Um, obviously, with burnout and the high caseloads, there have been issues with staff morale and people just feeling very overloaded, especially coming... Um, I guess coming out of the pandemic, you know, that was obviously personally challenging for staff, but then they had to, as healthcare providers, continue to put, you know, take care of people um, despite having very limited resources. And I think that that has taken a toll on our staff. Um, so we actually um, applied for and were awarded some supplemental block grant funding to support employee wellness, and we are launching a series of mindfulness uh, workshops for staff, just for them to practice mindfulness skills and um, just focus on them because we realize that it's very difficult to pour from an empty cup, right? So um, the last one that I had addressed was to investigate the best practices and implement a medication monitoring system. And so this is specific to foster youth um, and all youth, actually. It's very important, as you can imagine, to monitor the medications that youth are taking. Those should be very uh, tightly controlled. And we want to make sure that we reduce the use of polypharmacy wherever possible. We don't want to see our kids on a lot of psychotropic medications. 
That is not ideal. Next slide. Oh, is that it? I think that's it. All right, well, thank you. <clears throat> thanks, Elise. Uh, thanks, Elise, for driving that, and uh, that, that of a backseat driver after all. So as, as I said earlier, um, this is something we want to continue to bring to the board. Um, hopefully, the next uh, audit that we present will be the triennial, which means that, that we have one every three years. We had one in December. We're waiting on those results, and so we'll bring that forward um, once we get them. But with that, um, does the board have any questions or, or comments about this? I'm hoping this was useful um, because I think some of the data is very compelling. <laughs> and I hope you think the same. Right. In, in reading the, uh, the, the report that they provided, it really helped in, in, in seeing their recommendations and then even the actual um, initiatives that you're going to pull forward with, with your recommendations, I see that they match some of their recommendations, which helps. Um, and really getting down to where you're at helps progress for constructive, you know, constructive uh, steps forward. So, um, so I, I was able to see some of that. I'm confused about some of the graphs, but I know it was, was it uh, the group that did a behavioral health uh, concepts, they do that? Did they do that for the state too? Because I found the state document, they do the same percentage rates the same way, and I'm like, okay, that percent doesn't look the same. And then there's a graph a couple pages later that shows a different percent, so I don't know. I, I believe uh, the Department of Healthcare Services contracts with behavioral health concepts yes. to, to perform these audits on all of the state mental health plans. And, and again, this audit just speaks to our mental health uh, programs, I not think substance Sam needs disorder. To pull the microphone oh, a little uh, yeah. This uh, speaks to our mental health programs and not um, the COC, the Housing Continuing of Care, or Substance Use Disorder Services. I mean, they all overlap, but this is just specific to our mental health services. Okay. Yeah, Supervisor and, and that that was one of my questions was what's the breakdown because I see MHP MHP MHP, uh, but I didn't see that breakdown. So that was one of my questions. I appreciate that clarification. Absolutely appreciate this report. I, I have been asking and asking and asking for data, and while this is an analysis of data, it's not just data. It, it, in the long run, that's what we need, is how do we analyze the data to figure out where we stand today. And not to say, uh, I, I don't mean to use the words of, I don't care where we stand, but at least we know what needs to get done and what we should be focusing on now with an analysis. My, my question for you is, you said that you have a report from last year. How long have you, have you been getting annual audits on this? Oh, oh yes, um, and I'd be more than happy to send that along. We can, Supervisor. They're also publicly available on our website, um, and we'd be happy to send a link. It's a little bit buried. We could be better about publicizing that, but yes, the public can read them, and they've been going on for forever. Yeah. Because I, I think this is a great annual conversation. Um, and a, as uh, Ms. Jones was pointing out in one of the graphs we were looking, it, it is about progress. Let me turn off this audio here. There you go. <laughs> so that, that needed an echo. It's it, all about it, progress. It, it's, progress. A, it, it's all about progress. We know where we want to be, uh, especially when we're comparing ourselves. Uh, but we can't just jump and go from whatever percent to 5% to 10% without understanding what the work is required to get there. And as long as we're moving in that direction, I think that that's, that's what we should all be aiming for is progress. Uh, wondering if you have a definition of what small county is, because what am I comparing myself to? Am I comparing myself to El Dorado, which is completely different demographic than what we have here? Or am I comparing myself to uh, Mendocino? I, just kind of curious, I didn't see a definition for small counties. That's a great question, Supervisor, and it the designations is actually frontier, small, urban. I don't have them all memorized. And they're by population, so just the number of, uh, and probably population density as well. Um, and so we can provide that. Um, I'm sure, it, I'm surprised it's not in the report, but we'll find that. And maybe it is, and I missed that part, but I was just curious, what am I comparing myself to the state? That's kind of a given what I'm looking at, uh, but couldn't tell for the small counties. Uh, in Clear Lake with La Voz, um, 
I'm just curious if there's a breakdown. Are you seeing a greater penetration of access to our Latino community members because of La Voz being in that area? And in comparison to say Kelseyville, where we have another large uh, Latino population, that you're not seeing that same level of penetration? Just wondering if there's that physical accessibility uh, facility in an area, how much that makes the difference versus not having that accessible facility. Uh, that'd be a nice breakdown to see, to see if maybe we need to look at uh, splitting levels or creating another one if that's even feasible. But just kind of curious about uh, the level of accessibility and what the different penetrations look like depending on what's available in each community. Because we know that transportation is not always the easiest for everyone to be able to access everything. Um, and that's what we are hoping to um, utilize our new cargo van uh, to do. Uh, as you know, we have peer support centers throughout the county, um, but people are sitting in these facilities waiting for folks to come. So with a van, we can go out, and you mentioned Kelseyville. That is an area that, that we definitely plan um, outreach. So um, this hopefully might be one of more more than one van to come um, as we roll it out, no pun intended, and, and reach out to the community um, in order to, to reach those folks that aren't able to come to our peer support center. Awesome. And my last question is the uh, drug monitoring. Absolutely agree that that's something that uh, should be focused on. Uh, the idea of going from, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, from an MHP to a ODS, as you stated in the beginning, is that something that would absolutely help us when it comes to the drug uh, monitoring and things like that, or is that kind of separate? Go for it. Okay. So, um, there's a lot to unpack there. So ODS, Organized Delivery System, is specific to substance use disorder treatment mm -hmm. services. However, it is a step towards parity um, with regard to mental health and substance use disorder services. So this is my little uh, pulpit here, but uh, mental health as a whole has not had parity with healthcare, right? And that's changing through Cal AIM. So Cal AIM is a huge initiative to have parity both in terms of rate of pay um, and also the expansion of services for special mental health services, substance use disorder treatment services also have not had parity even with mental health. And so both of those initiatives are kind of bringing everything into the fold of healthcare as a whole and addressing the whole person. Um, but specifically ODS again is for substance use disorder treatment services. Um, so does that answer the question? So it, it has the potential to help, but it's not the fix. Uh, it still requires more to come. Yes, it's, it's actually part of the state's overall plan to integrate uh, mental health and substance use disorder services. And I believe they've thrown out a date of 2028 for that true integration. But this is, this is the state working to put those two things together. And this is really useful because I'm actually going to a Cal AIM um, workshop tomorrow. I think it is tomorrow. Uh, I'll fi figure out when I read out my calendar. Um, my last question is, we're talking about staff shortages and the inability to meet the actual needs. Uh, in there it says that we have, uh, on average, three or fewer, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going off the top of the head, three or fewer services per person when other counties are seeing more, uh, which means that they have access to certain things and then it kind of drops off because that's not available. And then it says that 75% of all the services are brought to you by the county behavioral health and 25% is brought to you by our contractors and things. Um, to me, that, 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 that sets a stage of what to look for and what to expand on um, because we can't expect you guys to take on the entire role of everything um, and when 75% of, what, of what's being offered is already going directly through you. So I hope that we're able to work with our partners to be able to expand what programs are available and eligible for our community members to access so we can go from three or fewer to now three or more uh, so we can get to a better range of services to meet the needs of uh, the people that we serve. So I, I appreciated this report tremendously uh, and I look forward to the future conversations this is going to bring up. my screen real quick. I'll show you what I mean. I know it's not a reflection upon, but maybe you can explain, because you probably know this better than I do. So let me share my screen on this. Um, and it's, oh wow, there we go. Share content, uh, screen, and then, let's see here.
Is share screen enabled, Matthew? Yeah, I had to press the button. It was my own fault. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so let me go to right here. There we go. Okay. So you'll see, um, and I have a pointer. Maybe you can see, you probably can't see it. It's on. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So first, like I, I realized after reading this, it says monthly unduplicated medical eligibles, 19,672. And then here it will say annual. So i um, wondering if that is just the average monthly and then like next month it might be 19,750 or you know what I'm saying? So it is an annual number and is it, um, it's an annual number but the, the average for each month is like 19,672. I'm not sure if that's the case because when you, when you multiply that by 12, we don't have that many citizens in the county. And so, um, and then it says, so it says 849 out of the 19,000. And it says here 71%, however, I calculated 4%. And then if you go over to, uh, I think that's the one. No, that's uh, actually, it doesn't have that. Um, yeah, it doesn't even have that uh, graph, you'll see. It, it goes straight to another um, table. But then when you go down to um, the Hispanic po population, you'll see it says, uh, 8,694, and then 161, and then it says 18.5. And then when you go to the graph for the Hispanic uh, calculator, you see it says that same number, if that makes sense. So, so they're calculating that according to this, and then we don't have a graph to show on the other one, except for right here, it says that we're at 70%. Um, which would be, if we're at 60% eligible, which would be um, of our population right here, 60%, 59.7 of 32,937, which is this amount, and we're serving 841, that number wouldn't be 71%, it would be 4%. And I realized that all of these added up equal 100%, or actually 95%, so this Asian Pacific is like 0.5% or something. And then when you look over here on, I think it's right here, does it say Asian Pacific? Yeah, right here. You'll see it says 2%. So I just, so I don't know if you guys can explain it or if maybe the group, you know, the behavioral health uh, concepts could explain that. Cause it's just, that, that's a little confusing, but I seen on their graphs, they do the same thing. So I, so I don't know on the state graphs, it does the same thing. And so, um, so I just, I don't know if that, I just n annotate that and, and note that, and that on your graph for right here where it says total 32,000, which is half of our population basically, um, it says 100% here. However, 3.6% 3, 3 is the percentage where my, my um, pointer is. And then when you look at the total um, right here, it says that same 3.6%, which the graph you showed on your presentation as well. So I just, I don't know how we figure that out, or maybe you can just give me an email showing how they calculate that or whatever the case may be, but I just, I just, I was struggling with it when I was looking through it, so. Um, but I know sometimes there's difference in how things are calculated, so I just wanted to highlight that maybe. Yeah, we'll have to get back to you on that one. All right. I must say I'm impressed with your mathematical yes, prowess. <laughs> well, baseball has averages, uh -huh. <laughs> so. I'll stop scare. Yeah. All right. Are there any other questions from the board or go ahead and see what More of a comment, just you know, thank you very much for the report. I know we've had conversations about really tracking where we're going here. So appreciate the outside agency coming in, you know, and giving us a tool to measure between now and next year when we have this report. Would appreciate and thank you for letting us know that the report is online, the other ones that have been done previously. Um, you know, but ultimately, we got work to do. And, um, you know, this clearly lays that out for us. You know, there are 10 sections here, and only two are met. I know some say partially met, but but we got a lot of work to do. And, and the real concerning ones, obviously, is the the 
clinical continuum care, the psychotropic medication monitoring for youth, real important, because as you guys said, you guys are triaging right now when the crisis is happening. But that follow-up is so important, because if it's not there, it's just going to happen again and again, and it's going to go from being when they're adolescent into the adulthood, and that's the real the real trauma that's happening to the families and our communities around, um, in the Native American community, uh, in every community that has a stigmatism. We got to get over that. Uh, it is definitely something, but it's so important on the medication. If someone is supposed to be taking that medication, that we make sure the best of our ability, you can't force someone to do it, but that is continual because that's where it really falls apart. And like I said, we all, as community members, family members, uh, understand, oh, it's crisis day, you know, so then everybody's in up an arm, but then it goes away. Uh, it's just like some of our emergencies we have when, when it's, you know, really bad, you see it, uh, but there's so much more of that long-term recovery that needs to happen. So I appreciate this information. I want us to be at five of these met next year. <laughs> I hate to put that on you like that, but you know we need to be increasing that. We need to meet all these needs as closely as possible. So uh, I appreciate it. We have a measuring tool. We're here to support you in those things. I think some of the decisions we've made when you're talking about employee retention and morale and other things, that's a later on conversation on our agenda. So we, we hear that, but we also need to just keep making those strides and those steps. And hopefully we're going to see a change in that next year when it comes back too. But greatly appreciate it because it really helps us when we do get those calls and we do all get those calls. I would think, uh, you know, I can't be the only one that gets a call from uh, someone who's concerned with, you know, uh, the wait time to see a psychiatrist or, or other follow-up things that need to happen. So greatly appreciate it for the report. Uh, but here, as you guys are moving through this process, we're here to support you to help take care of our community. So thank you very much for today's report. Thank you. Do you have anything, Tina? No, just thank you for the report, and I, I agree. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> All right. Any questions for us? No, just thank you, and um, I know how to get a hold of you all. Oh, wait, I, I forgot the public, my poll. Um, I'll open it up for public input. Anybody in the chambers have any uh, comments about this uh, item in this presentation? Not seeing anyone in the chambers get up, and then I'm looking online. I don't see any hands raised. Two, three, two, one, and I'll bring it back to the board and close this item. And thank you again for the presentation. I appreciate the information. It was very helpful. A lot of pages to read and go through, but, you know, it really was... Um, it was good to be able to check and balance some things and look at them, you know, aside from those numbers, but that, I, that's them. So we'll figure that out from them. Like, how are you, you know, doing that? But either way, um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And more to come. Mm -hmm. All right.